Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. This is Amanda Scott at Capture Higher Ed. And I have Jack Klett with me here today. We still have folks signing on. So I'm just gonna give us maybe one minute for all attendees to get logged in and then we'll get started. All right, it's officially uh, 01, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Again, my name is Amanda Scott. I'm a senior director here at Capture Higher Ed. I am a higher ed person. Uh, last seated position was in financial aid, director of financial aid at a university in the Southeast. And um, I've been on the enrollment consulting side of um, higher ed for about six years. And um, I'm here today with my colleague, Jack, that many of you heard on our first webinar, Graduate Recruitment Strategies That Make the Dean's List, about a year ago, as he was a guest uh, working at Jefferson University. And we thank you for being here for part two today. Um, this webinar was one that we launched three different times and actually was at NAGAP as a session where we had standing room only. So we walked in a little bit nervous on that one when we ran out of chairs. So. Um, by popular demand, we're happy to have you guys here to talk about, you know, where does this take us now? How do we apply it to your each in this institution in particular? So without any further ado, I want to hand it over to Jack Klett, who is our Director of Graduate and Online Initiatives here at Capture. Amanda, thank you. And hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Jack Klett, as Amanda mentioned. Director of Graduate and Online Initiatives for Capture Higher Ed. Uh, this is a Capture Higher Ed web presentation, strategies to amp up your graduate recruitment efforts this cycle. I'm super excited to be here uh, with my colleague Amanda and friend uh, to provide, I think, some real solutions to uh, what many see, uh, certainly what I see and what others see, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment, um, as uh, today's greatest challenges in graduate uh, enrollment. Uh, for those that uh, need a refresher on who I am, I've been in higher ed for 20 years. Uh, aside from a brief stint working in the halls of Congress, I basically never left higher ed. Um, aside from five years serving on the academic side of the house as Associate Dean of Graduate Studies, uh, the majority of my time has been spent in enrollment management. Amanda, I am so happy to be back with you for this. Um, it begs the question, how did we get here? Uh, and the folks in our audience, uh, as you mentioned, are not new to the two of us. They've heard from us before. Um, this should look uh, uh, pretty familiar to everyone, uh, graduate recruitment strategies that makes the dean's list. So over the past year, uh, Amanda, you and I have been presenting on graduate recruitment strategies. Um, I think, uh, as you mentioned, three webcasts, uh, plus that standing room only presentation at NAGAP this past April uh, in New Orleans, which was super fun. Uh, the feedback and the response that we got uh, was very good, and that was great to see. And a lot of the feedback had to do uh, really with the strategies, because we've been talking up to this point in more of general terms about strategies to address these key challenges. And the feedback that we received was that people were really happy about, um, about a lot of those strategies that we talked about, but we're really drilling into specifics. Um, and that is what we will be able uh, to provide uh, today. So I wanna give a, a quick recap uh, on what we've talked about this past year. Uh, so ba basically uh, what I've done is I've set the stage by encouraging our colleagues uh, to think of their recruitment efforts as their own business model. So as you see uh, here in this graphic, uh, the business model canvas is represented here at the center of this slide. Um, so our models, uh, in graduate enrollment focus on conveying the key value propositions of our institutions, our graduate programs, uh, to our key customers, our students, uh, future students, prospective students, but our models do not exist uh, in a vacuum. So while we control most things that happen within the model, right, how are we going to engage, how are we going to convey the value propositions, how are we going to build those relationships with prospective students, we cannot control 
all the external environmental forces within which our models operate. So you see the environmental factors here that are exerting pressure and influence on what goes on within our model. And these factors are political, social, cultural, economic, and physical. Uh, the decline in international enrollments, for example, is influenced by the political. Uh, Washington, Washington is not necessarily sending out the most welcoming of messages uh, to international students. Uh, you compound that with the social cultural factors of gun violence in America and how it is reported. Uh, and folks are dubious about safety uh, in the United States these days. Um, so that is a, a quick example of political, social, uh, cultural. All of us in graduate admissions know the economy, labor markets, uh, and salaries influence student decisions to return to college for an advanced degree, uh, and the physical. Anyone who has experienced torrential rain or snow during a scheduled open house uh, knows exactly what I'm talking about, uh, about the influence of the physical environment on our efforts. So how do we work to offset some of these things uh, that are not in our control? This has been a big piece of what we've been discussing this past year. So a lot of what we have presented on has been informed by survey data from Council of Graduate Schools and others, specifically as to the challenges that deans of graduate studies and graduate schools are grappling uh, with. So our last presentation, um, the strategies that make the dean's list, uh, focused on uh, these challenges as really communicated and seen through the lens of our graduate deans. Um, it certainly focused on the political and economic climate. Uh, you know, last year we were deep in that international decline. Um, also increased competition um, as more and more institutions are building, growing, and expanding graduate programs as a way to offset some of the stagnant growth um, in undergraduate net tuition revenue the shaping of the class, right? It's not just about how many students were able to enroll in a program or meeting that specific program enrollment goal, but also what is the, uh, what is the, the qualitative makeup of that class? Uh, what is the demographic makeup of that class? What are the diversity implications um, as well? Um, organic lead generation uh, and the struggle around creating more organic leads and trying to offset a bit of the graduate stealth application issue. And then how do we operate within environments where we're asked to do more and more, our staffs are asked to do more and more, and there are limited financial resources and limited uh, human resources uh, to do the more. Um, we have now taken this a step further, uh, moving past uh, the, the graduate deans, um, I love this here. If speaking is silver, then listening is gold. Amanda, we have gone for the gold. Uh, so this time we have listened to graduate recruiters uh, and directors of graduate recruitment and admissions, our GEM professionals. Uh, we went directly to the source and these conversations uh, were from sea to shining sea. We were talking with large public, small privates, centralized admissions models, decentralized. Uh, many of the people we spoke with um, even are in our audience uh, today, so welcome and thanks for continuing the conversation. Uh, and what we learned was that there are some key on-the-ground challenges, key pain points um, that graduate recruitment directors and graduate uh, recruiters uh, are experiencing that need real solutions. So today we're going to talk about those and hopefully help folks relieve some of those pains uh, and create some important, meaningful gains. Uh, so Amanda, would you like to go ahead and kick us off? Sure. Some of the challenges that we have discovered with our research is that roughly 85% of graduate enrollment is at the master's degree level. So what this means is this is in comparison to people who might be getting a law degree or a medical degree that the saturation point is the traditional master's level. And most of those people are just applying to the institution for which they want to attend. So the pain point in that is getting in front of them before they decide which school they want to apply to. Because one of the things that we have here is that yield is not necessarily the issue, but searching and, and lead qualification is changing. 
Jack, talk to me about some of those shifts. Yeah, so you're you're exactly uh, right, and that's been one of the the key things that we've come across in the conversation. That if you take a look at yield at the uh, yield of the graduate student, you compare that to undergrad, uh, graduate students yield at a far higher rate. And uh, for the most part, this is because graduate students are doing a lot of research um, in a stealth way uh, prior to making decision of where to apply, and then they are applying to a program, and often. Uh, it is a single a program, single program that they are applying to. So the question really isn't so much is this student going to attend my institution or another institution. The question is is this student going to going to attend my institution or not or choose not to attend graduate study at this time. So the challenge that we're facing um, and that folks on the ground are facing uh, really exists uh, more top of funnel. Right, and with those lead qualification, um, there are companies out there that are working to provide leads that are in the grad sphere, but how have you seen and heard from other companies in terms of their performance with overall enrollment? Well, I think this connects directly to the challenges that we're seeing with traditional graduate search, right? And, and by traditional graduate search, I'm referring to, you know, often purchasing a list of um, standardized test takers, GRE, GMAT, uh, for example, um, serving those folks emails, uh, maybe taking them to a landing page, uh, trying to get some type of uh, response. And what we're seeing on the ground is the traditional graduate search is simply no longer producing the results of years past. Um, I include myself in the group that are at fault for this. <laughs> we are at fault for this, um, mm -hmm. the collective we. And the reason for that is because uh, many of our graduate programs, and certainly this is in comparison to undergrad, many of our graduate programs have either decided to no longer require the standardized test or have developed a series of mechanisms to waive those tests. So what happens is we're now purchasing lists of test takers. These are students who have reviewed and researched a program and decided I am applying to X program, and that program requires the GRE. So therefore, I'm taking the GRE. And when we purchase that list and are communicating with that student, this is no longer a matter of the student being in an open phase of consideration. We are now in a position where we have to change that student's mind. Um, so what we are doing now because of the decline in the inquiries that typically would be produced through graduate student search, uh, we are relying on a lot of external partners to provide us with qualified leads. Um, and the fact of the matter is, is that no matter how qualified, these leads are not going to perform at organic inquiry rates. Organic inquiry rates continue to be the strongest performing inquiry. These are the folks who are going to your site and requesting information uh, directly or calling the office um, or sending an email. Um, so that's something to consider um, as, we, as we move forward. You know, you gave me a great example at one point in time, and I'm going to put you on the spot for it when you worked for one of the institutions, that, one of the five institutions that you <laughs> served. <laughs> We're not going to name which one, but you were over graduate enrollment. And talk to me about how your budget compared in resources and human resources and financial resources compared to the undergrad budget with the same goal. It paled in comparison. Um, so we basically had the same uh, headcount goal, enrollment goal, um, as undergrad. Uh, we had about 40% of the undergrad budget uh, and about 40% of the undergrad staff. Um, so the undergrad staff uh, was 12 plus, uh, and we were dealing with about uh, four folks uh, plus myself. So, um, and, and that is not atypical. Uh, as we've had conversations on the ground here, um, that is very common uh, in what has been uh, uh, the, the pressure, I should say, uh, the work that has been placed on graduate enrollment teams. And the fact of the matter is, is that many of these teams, Amanda, were designed for an era of centralized application processing. Um, and now they're being asked to proactively recruit. Um, so these teams are understaffed and they are underfunded. Uh, for those functions. Um, it is necessary for these teams to be doing this important proactive work. And we're actually going to have, this is going to be a shameless plug, but we're going to have a great conversation on December 4th with uh, the president of NAGAP, Keith Ramsdell, and the vice president of NAGAP, Jeremiah Nelson, 
they're going to be joining me as we're going to kind of talk about the state of graduate enrollment management. And GEM has been really evolving um, over the course of the years. So that'll be a good conversation, I think, that will drill down uh, even further on some of these, uh, some of these uh, challenges that are facing graduate enrollment teams. All right, Jack. Well, we're, before I turn you loose to talk about these pain points, I want to tell everyone that it, you can submit questions into the question box. I failed to tell you that at the very beginning. And then we're going to answer questions at the very end. So as Jack starts explaining here, make sure you ask some questions for us. Yes, ask away. Thanks. Thanks, Amanda. So uh, those responsible for recruiting and enrolling these students um, into our graduate programs have key problems. And, and this, these are really the, the, the pain points and the challenge set that's been communicated to us um, from folks on the ground. So identifying the challenge and identifying true quality, high performing leads, high performing inquiries, conveying the value proposition of these specific programs uh, to these leads uh, in ways that resonate, in ways that are student facing. As we mentioned, the NEMIC staff resources to engage these prospective students um, and with these limited resources, um, the struggle that our graduate recruiters and our admissions counselors have on knowing which prospective students to engage, when to engage them, how to engage them. And then as we mentioned, poor performance with traditional graduate search strategies. So what does modern graduate search look like? Um, and if we are still doing traditional graduate search, which by the way, many people are doing, many enrollment teams are doing, how do we optimize traditional graduate search uh, for better results? So we really came to um, this solution set. Um, so as we were thinking about all the various challenges that existed, um, it really came down to four key solutions uh, that we want to talk about uh, today. And that is all around building awareness, capturing the interest that comes out of that um, awareness building, increasing the conversion of the folks uh, who have inquired, and then one of the most important, forging meaningful relationships. And I'm gonna talk about this a lot because this has been the joy of my work as I've been at institutions and as communicated to us, it continues to be the joy of the work of many people in graduate enrollment today. So we will talk about all of that. So let's get started with building awareness. Um, I'm gonna start with kind of what I refer to as modern graduate search. And we hear a lot about digital marketing, so I've done my best to just kind of simplify it for our purposes today. Um, so in short, I mean, a comprehensive digital marketing strategy is the foundation of graduate recruitment. So like I mentioned, it is modern graduate search. Here's something, Amanda, that I think you will find interesting. 1.3 billion people engage with a search engine every single day. 1.3 billion. 80% of them do not continue past the first page of search results. So our prospective students are part of that 1.3 billion. So optimizing search engine marketing uh, is a key strategy for promoting brand uh, and program awareness. And of course, we have partners, institutions uh, who work with us who are doing some great things with Google, Google AdWords, Yahoo, uh, and Bing. And it's important to point out that this is not one size fits all. Uh, it's a highly customizable approach. And the budget range for those with limited resources the budget range is extremely flexible. Um, you are basically setting the price. So um, there's a lot that can be done there in terms of customization, uh, and we can talk about that as we move forward. Um, our prospective graduate students are professionals. Um, so engaging them on the social platform for professionals is key. And for folks who are not aware, uh, LinkedIn has really stepped up their game. They are doing some uh, amazing things. Uh, so we see this in terms of their LinkedIn uh, content advertising, uh, the way in which you can now target your audiences so that they're matching a specific graduate program persona set. Um, LinkedIn in-mail, the ability to deliver uh, messages directly through the LinkedIn platform uh, to those that resonate with your prospective student persona set. And then now taking it a step further, 
with LinkedIn matched audiences. So LinkedIn now allows us to take an entire graduate pool, admissions pool, and serve it over to the platform. And through a, a matching process, they're able to match the data set with existing uh, user profiles on LinkedIn and then serve relevant advertising, even at the program level, uh, to folks uh, within that pool. So that is just an example of some of the things that LinkedIn is doing. And I'm going to talk about something else uh, that LinkedIn is doing as we start to get into that uh, capturing um, uh, interest um, and, and building inquiry phase. Um, beyond that, it's not enough to just meet our, P our, our prospective students on their um, professional platform. Um, it's also important to gauge these professionals in their play space. So that is what paid social prospecting is all about. Uh, leveraging targeting filters on Facebook and Instagram uh, to reach the right prospective student. So these three digital strategies, your search engine marketing, uh, engaging the professional via LinkedIn, uh, engaging via the play space through paid social prospecting. Uh, these three strategies are all designed to build awareness and push people to your .edu. So what then we need to focus on is how do we remain front of mind, right? People are coming to the .edu, they are going to leave. So having a strong web or site retargeting campaign will then follow folks around once they leave your .edu, encouraging a return to your institution site via a specific call to action. And again, most importantly, keeping your institution or specific graduate program front of mind. Okay, so you have a strong digital marketing effort to build awareness and interest. So what are the best ways to then capture that interest? and generate inquiries that will perform at or near organic rates. So this is where we get directly into that major pain point of the top of funnel work um, that folks are really focused on. Um, here are the strategies that uh, we recommend. First, capture behavioral engagement. So I can, I can hear folks now. I actually can't hear you because you're muted, but I can imagine uh, saying, well, what, <laughs> what on earth is that? What is capture behavioral engagement? So I'm not going to go in a long, drawn-out explanation. I'm going to explain it to you in its simplest form. Capture Behavioral Engagement, or CBE, is simply a string of code. It's a string of code that you place on your website, on your .edu, and this code then empowers a suite of tools that will capture interest in ways that you've likely never done before, namely progressive identification uh, and affinity prospects, um, and then I'll also, in this area of capturing interest, want to touch on that other LinkedIn strategy that I was mentioning earlier, LinkedIn lead generation forms. So progressive identification forms um, are a form of dynamic content uh, that is triggered by marketing automation. Um, is, for many, you might be familiar with those terms. For others, not so much. Uh, putting it aside, I'll explain it to you shortly. Uh, remember that string of code on the site, that CBE code? Well, it tracks individual visitors who come to your .edu. Um, as these visitors visit graduate tag pages, be they admissions pages or academic program pages, financial aid pages, the progressive ID form will trigger and display. So here's an example from our friends at UTK. This form serves multiple populations from graduate to undergrad. I think you can see their incoming freshman transfer international, um, et cetera. Uh, the visitor to the site never needed to formally select a request for information link. This progressive identification form displayed because the code recognized that this was someone seeking information based on the types of pages being visited. Uh, these are pretty powerful results for UTK. Uh, 26,655 forms were submitted. Of those, 21,109 were completely new to UTK's pool. And of those, nearly 3,000 of them were interested in graduate studies. So these submissions are now inquiries for UTK, uh, and they perform at or near organic inquiry rate. Um, so what about all the people who don't complete this form, right? Because we've all been on, on sites, and we've had forms pop up, and we just kind of X out of them. 
Um, so what about those people that don't complete the form or any form for that matter, right? Including your own um, embedded organic request information form. Um, but they're still visiting the site. And this is where Affinity Prospects comes in. Um, so that CBE code that I mentioned is still doing awesome things, right? For those folks that aren't filling out forms. It is on the back end assigning a score from one to 100 of all the visitors, all the unique visitors that come to your .edu. Once the code has determined that a visitor is behaving like a graduate inquiry, it will flag that student. These flagged visitors are then provided to your graduate recruiter, your graduate recruitment team, as an affinity prospect and should be treated as a new graduate inquiry. Again, that is the work that the CBE, the Capture Behavioral Engagement Code, is doing on the back end um, so that these folks who never clearly raised their hand and said, yes, I am an inquiry, but whose behavior makes them uh, an affinity prospect. So those are passed along and flagged and treated as new graduate inquiries. So in this capturing interest area, I want to come back to LinkedIn. Uh, LinkedIn is now using lead generation forms or lead gen forms. Uh, you can target a specific profile of LinkedIn users. Um, again, this might be based on an analysis that you've done of your programs. You maybe have done a, a, an analysis, an historic data analysis to see the various uh, buckets, if you will, personas, if you will, of students who make up enrollment in any of your given programs. Um, so you can use the targeting capability uh, to specifically uh, serve content uh, to those folks. Uh, and with one click, uh, those LinkedIn users are able to populate an inquiry form with data uh, from their LinkedIn profile and login credential set. So those then populated, automatically populated forms, those leads are then forwarded directly to the graduate recruiter. So with the progressive identification forms, with the affinity prospects, and with the LinkedIn lead gen forms, um, these are qualified leads that are performing at or near organic rate. So really tackling that struggle uh, with uh, needing to increase that top of funnel work, uh, the organic inquiry. Okay, so we've tackled building awareness. Uh, we've tackled capturing interest. Um, at this point, I want to turn our attention to uh, increasing conversion. Um, and what do we see right away, Amanda? We see that tricky CVE code again. Um, this time, that code is powering dynamic content and marketing automation in the form of creative and content pieces with a specific call to action. So we're going to see that here in a moment. We also see landing pages with student-facing messaging, um, and more on that in a moment, and we see the return of the web or site uh, retargeting. So here is an example of a dynamic content, uh, content piece uh, that CBE code has triggered. Excuse me, I needed to wet my whistle there. So this triggered uh, based on visitors to Stetson University's graduate academic pages. Um, given the content you can see here, this is an MBA program, so um, it triggered specifically based on uh, graduate business, business to graduate business tagged pages. Now, this dynamic content piece um, is in the form of a popover, but there are 11 different types of dynamic content that CBE, uh, Capture Behavioral Engagement, can trigger, ranging from toasters that pop up that might be pushing an upcoming info session to a triggered email from a faculty member that gets delivered to a visitor who is exploring um, a specific program uh, web page set. Uh, visitors who are served dynamic content are five times more likely to apply and enroll. Uh, even those who don't interact with the content that they are served, uh, simply by being served that content, are more likely to apply and enroll uh, than those who are not served dynamic content at all. Uh, for those uh, that do interact with the content, the content may take them to a landing page. Uh, so a moment on landing pages. Landing pages are very helpful 
in communicating the value proposition of specific graduate programs in what I refer to as market-facing or student-facing ways. Um, our graduate collateral, um, and this was certainly the case of the institutions uh, where I was seated, um, that collateral is often academic-facing. And that makes sense because much of it is produced uh, either directly by faculty or in heavy consultation with faculty. Uh, faculty live in their academic space, which is great, as they should. Um, and this is what makes faculty so powerful in the recruitment process. But there are times when we want to communicate the benefits of a program quickly um, in a way that's visually appealing, in a way that um, is very uh, user friendly. So landing pages are a powerful way to do that. And remember those progressive identification forms that I mentioned um, earlier when we were talking about capturing interest? They can trigger on these landing pages or they can simply be embedded uh, on these landing pages and um, include pick lists for academic program of interest, uh, anticipated start term, et cetera, as they are um, completely customizable. So I wanna move on to uh, web and site retargeting. So this is the second time I'm mentioning this particular strategy, this time in the area um, where we're really focused on conversion. So remember, these are the ads that follow folks around once they leave your .edu. Um, to maximize conversion, it's important to remain front of mind, and that is exactly what uh, website retargeting does. Uh, here you get to see how it interacts with that CBE code I keep talking about. So CBE code, um, as you can tell, does a whole bunch of things, and one of the things that it does is it powers um, a user-friendly dashboard for um, our graduate enrollment teams. So here you see um, a visitor contact profile with this visitor's unique visit history. And where you see the blue bullseyes that the arrows are kind of calling out, um, these are the moments when the visitor, when this particular prospective student clicked on one of those uh, web retargeting ads off of your .edu site and was then brought back to your, D, to your .edu site because of that click action. Uh, this particular example was for Biola University, uh, where we had uh, uh, retargeting um, ads as, around a, a scholarship campaign. Um, and these, tool, these tools all work together uh, to increase conversion. So I want to come to um, our final solution set. And this is the one that gives me uh, the most personal joy. Um, our graduate recruitment staff, and this is what we've heard um, from folks on the ground, um, find great joy in building meaningful relationships with prospective students and really serving uh, the counselor aspect of their role. Uh, the fact of the matter is, um, and this always amazed me about my teams, I'm very fortunate over the years to work with some incredibly talented um, members of, of the staff. And the fact of the matter is that most every one of them could have been making a lot more money um, in sales uh, in the private sector uh, than they're ever going to make uh, serving as a graduate recruiter or as a graduate counselor. Um, but they're not in it for the money. Um, they're in it for uh, the relationships and for the environment that higher education represents. Um, it's part of the reason why so many of us here on the call and, and myself included um, have made a career out of working uh, in higher education. So for me, it's really important to be able to deliver strategies that allow for these relationships to be fostered um, in ways that are meaningful. Um, so what you've seen so far are tools that um, are very student facing. Uh, but that CBE code is also providing a lot of counselor-facing information that powers that counselor's ability to forge these meaningful relationships. So we're going to talk a little bit about counselor engagement training. We're going to talk about um, a daily visitor's report uh, and what that means. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about prospect scoring and how that informs the counselor outreach strategy. And also, lastly, we'll talk a bit about um, dynamic content this time not in the form of web-based dynamic content, but uh, more in the form of direct mail and meaningful things like handwritten notes that come from counselors or faculty members um, or letters uh, or postcards. Uh, so we will talk about all of that here in, uh, in a moment. Um, 
So every single morning, uh, counselors will find one of these uh, in their uh, inbox when they come to work. Uh, what you see here here is a quick example of a daily visitor's report. Uh, and I'm gonna drill down into the actual individual visitor profile information that this report provides in a moment. Um, but every morning, this, this will be the first thing that pops up uh, in, in their inbox uh, when they come in to do their day's work. This report shows every single identified visitor who has been on the .edu over the past 24 hours. So it includes what information they read, uh, how long that unique visitor was on the site, um, and the daily visit report also provides a hot link that goes right to the visitor contact profile in the CBE dashboard. So here is the example of the prospective student visitor profile. Um, so you see the visit history here, that is the tab that's been highlighted. Uh, so this will allow the counselor to know all of the various pages uh, that this particular prospective student uh, was on, uh, and particularly what information then this particular student was interested in. And here you see that same visitor profile, um, but this time you see the notes features, the notes feature. Um, so notice the numbers, and I'll get back to this notes feature in a moment, but, but notice the numbers to the right of the prospective student's name. Uh, these are scores that have been informed by that CBE code. So I talked about counselor, counselor engagement training. Um, so one of the strategies is really to train counselors as to how to interpret this data and then to determine when and how to engage that prospective student in a way that is meaningful and relevant to the, that particular prospect's information needs. Uh, this allows the counselor to know what information to provide, what method of outreach to provide, um, and it also ensures that the message is received at a time when that prospect is ready and receptive to receiving it. And we know this because we know what that student is already interested in based on the information that they have been viewing. So when I was at Jefferson, uh, we had an external partner providing um, uh, the team with 800 uh, qualified uh, leads a year. So add to that the suspect lists that we acquired via GRE and GMAT list buys, add to that all the organic prospects we were receiving, um, I don't know about you, um, but my staff was overwhelmed uh, with the decision of who to contact and when and with what message. Um, and that kind of overwhelming sense can almost kind of uh, provide a moment of paralysis, right? Uh, this is, I don't have no idea who to engage. Uh, I don't know how to engage them. And uh, therefore, I'm not going to engage. Uh, and we know that we need to engage. And we know the folks, uh, our, our, our counselors and our staffs, want to engage in meaningful ways. So the daily visit report um, and the accompanying scoring uh, provide a quick hot list every day of the contacts to engage um, in order to make the most out of um, our counselors' already limited time. And the notes feature just allows for that engagement to be documented um, you know, without getting too much into the weeds here, uh, this dashboard and the data associated with it um, is completely, um, uh, I'm gonna butcher this, integratable, can be completely integrated into uh, our existing <laughs> CRMs. Right, right, I'm just making up words here, Amanda. So, Going good uh, there. Can completely, yeah, yeah. <laughs> can be completely integrated into our existing uh, CRMs. At Jefferson, we were using uh, Salesforce, but our folks were using Slate, um, et cetera. Um, but the, uh, the, the tool, the notes feature uh, allows counselors to quickly know when, of course, the last outreach occurred, in what way that outreach occurred, um, and how to then uh, re-engage uh, in a way that advances uh, that relationship. So we've talked a lot about awareness building. We've talked a lot about uh, generating interest, um, increasing conversion. Um, we've talked a lot about uh, building awareness. Um, I'm not going to go over this in detail, but I just want to show what it looks like when everything is uh, is put together. So this is the Capture Graduate Inquiry Solution Suite that brings together all the strategies that we have that we've mentioned to um, address those pain points that I was referencing at the beginning of the presentation. 
These strategies are designed to optimize your team's top of funnel work to get to that uh, gnarly, radical pain point of the top of funnel work. Um, it's incredibly important in terms of advancing and meeting our enrollment goals. Uh, this is the Capture Graduate Application Suite uh, that deploys the strategies I mentioned for that mid to lower funnel work. So increasing conversions, uh, building those relationships, remaining uh, front of mind, um, all of which is, is critically, um, critically important. And I want to mention that uh, these strategies are not one size fits all. Um, each graduate enrollment operation is unique. Um, Amanda, you know, part of this, this listening tour, uh, it was just so amazing to hear the differences in the makeup of enrollment operations at the graduate level um, across the country. Um, you know, so many folks are seated uh, within uh, college structures. Others have a completely centralized process that reports to enrollment management. Others are centralized for application processing, but not for recruitment. That is a, a more fractured approach. Um, so each graduate enrollment operation is unique. Uh, it's the nature um, of our often decentralized, fractured uh, graduate enrollment model. So uh, I'm happy um, to offer a personalized assessment to folks who are uh, with us today. Uh, let's have a conversation about your unique challenges, and, and I want to work basically together to help develop a strategy that empowers your team to achieve uh, your enrollment goals. I, Amanda, you and I were speaking about this uh, yesterday, I think, or the day before. Um, I really am in phase two of my career, right? Uh, I've worked at, at five different institutions. Um, I've led enrollment operations uh, at three of those. Um, I've, I've had an academic appointment. I've taught students. Um, my career journey, my professional journey is no longer about one specific institution. So instead, every day I'm focused on what can we do to relieve the pain points of my graduate enrollment colleagues that I have come to know over the past two decades in doing this and adding real value to our profession, which is why I get so excited about conversations like these and also the conversations with, um, uh, you know, talking about the, the evolution of graduate enrollment management, uh, like we have coming up with uh, the NAGAP folks uh, next month. Um, these discussions, uh, these assessments, uh, and the solution uh, sets that come with them uh, are the way I'm going to do this important work. So I am super happy Capture uh, has has asked me to join with them um, to do that. Uh, so I will leave you with this before we get to questions. I know we have those. Um, my friends, I leave you uh, with this wonderful Albert Einstein uh, uh, quote. Uh, I was often uh, guilty uh, at the sake of kind of indicting myself of doing the same things over and over and then adding new strategies each cycle. And uh, I don't know, you know, it was just, gosh, I don't want to get rid of that because, you know, that, that may have produced X number of students. And then, of course, we evolve in our profession and we learn the value of, of origin source codes, et cetera, as ways to measure conversion. Um, and finally, I needed to stop doing it. I mean, the staff couldn't take on uh, anymore and I needed to determine how to do things in a, in a smarter way to maximize uh, the return um, on our work. And I've been happily uh, doing that uh, in, in my seated positions um, and also in the, the consulting work that I've done for about 20 plus uh, partners over time. And that's when things really pivoted uh, for me um, and the institutions I worked for. Right? If you always do what you always did, you always get what you always got. Uh, so making sure that we really were able to measure the ROI of uh, past strategies, uh, determining whether or not they should be tweaked and iterated on for the next cycle, and implementing as many new solutions and new strategies as we could, uh, even if that meant just piloting. Um, so again, I, I'm happy to offer uh, the assessment. Uh, I'm coming to those assessments with the knowledge that's been gleaned by these conversations. Um, as well as the research that, that I've been doing and, of course, my own uh, professional experience. So with that, I will cease talking and turn it over to uh, questions. So ask away. 
Commissioner Jack. So um, everyone, if you have additional questions, I'm going to go ahead and start with one that we had come in, but you can put them in the drop down portion of the questions tab. So Jack, one of the questions is related to uh, capture behavioral engagement. And um, aside from the blog that I've been reading that I've received from you, um, what, how did CBE end up in the grad space? It's kind of something new that I haven't heard of before. So can you talk to me about, you know, how long it's been in the, in the space of grad? Yeah, well, CBE has been around um, in enrollment uh, for quite a while now, um, but it is it is newer, I think, uh, in terms of the graduate application. And I should tell everybody that one of the good things for me is that, you know, I was with Capture for a period of time, serving as a senior enrollment advisor for um, for institutions. And I left Capture to re to uh, move on to to Jefferson so that I could um, lead the recruitment effort there for. Uh, their merger year. People probably know that Philadelphia University and Thomas Jefferson University joined together as one to form the new Jefferson, um, and that was awesome. But um, the reason why I mention that is because I'm happy to tell you that um, uh, I was also a Capture client. So when I went to uh, Jefferson, we um, uh, used acquired CBE, Capture Behavioral Engagement, and we used it across populations. So we were using it for uh, our first year students, our transfer population, um, some interesting work actually around international students, um, and also using it with population. Um, so CBE um, itself has been used um, more as an add-on for some of the undergraduate work that's been done um, at institutions. Um, but I was able to witness firsthand the real power of it focused on the graduate student population because of that top of funnel struggle. Uh, the ability for that code to provide the data that we needed for counselor engagement, but also the ability to capture those prospects um, that I was really happy to see performing at such a powerful rate. So one of the great things um, to note is that at Jefferson, that progressive identification form, um, there were 1,100, a little over 1,100 uh, form fills. Of those, 852 of those were new to the Jefferson pool. They were not already in, um, they weren't even in suspect status. They were, they were not in our system at all. Um, so that was really, uh, really powerful. Also, one of the great things about CBE, the reason why I think it works particularly well at the graduate level is because our recruitment efforts, uh, because of the way that our prospective students want information, is very program centric, right? It's program, program, program. Our recruitment is at the program level. If we're fortunate, we can do some recruiting uh, within an area of interest set. So if we have graduate business programs, for example, uh, we can do some kind of uh, cross marketing. Uh, but so much of our work is done at the program level. So the ability to um, launch dynamic content um, and have student-specific scoring by program or by visits to specific program, academic program spaces, uh, um, um, at specific academic program pages uh, that will then trigger um, a handwritten note, for example, by a faculty member um, or an email from that student's um, uh, graduate counselor. Uh, that's one of the great ways in which it can be used um, at the graduate level that makes it really powerful for both interest generation and also, also conversion. Thank you. We have one more question. So I work in the College of Education in a decentralized uh, university. If I want to do an assessment like you were talking about, um, who do I need to invite to that? Well, I think it would be great to have representation. Um, from uh, whoever you uh, work with for marketing um, because university marketing uh, usually is a key stakeholder uh, for this type of strategy deployment. Uh, one, because of the, t the way in which uh, the kind of underlying infrastructure needs to be built uh, in the sense that um, code needs to be placed on a website, right? It doesn't take long for that to happen. In fact, it can literally occur in 10 minutes. I've witnessed it myself, um, but you need buy-in from folks to, to do that, uh, and then they'll launch some dynamic content on the website. Um, and also the, the digital marketing um, is important. Um, so uh, when you're thinking about digital marketing, um, the collateral that will inform that, of course, Capture takes care of the design, um, but 
you'll want to make sure that you have uh, some representation uh, from marketing there. And then um, whoever is in charge of your you know, actual kind of hand-to-hand -hand recruiting, um, it would be good to bring them to the table too so that we could really talk about the ways in which um, that uh, recruiter is engaging, um, the way the recruitment team is engaging with prospective students, um, and talk about the way in which um, the data that's gathered uh, through that CVE code placement uh, will be able to uh, power those efforts. Um, so that would be uh, that would be my uh, suggestion. And of course, you know, with the decentralized model, um, often that means that um, budgets are also decentralized. Uh, so if this was something where you were going to um, have to bring some other folks to the table um, to talk about the way in which um, uh, these strategies will be supported financially, uh, then I would bring those players to the table too. Um, you know, Capture is uh, multifaceted. It can serve many audiences at one time. Um, that's the benefit of the strategy. So uh, that would be my suggestion. Thank you. I'm going to um, answer this one last question and any of the remaining questions, be here to do hand-to-hand, -hand, Jack, and follow up individually. Will that work for you? It works for me. All right, good deal. So last one, um, a question, does Capture have a conference? I'm sorry, does Capture have a what? A conference. A conference. I believe we do have I mean, a conference. Yeah, a conference. Yeah. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, sure. I can take that one. Um, Capture has a conference. It's called Resolve, and Resolve is in January each year. Get it? New Year's resolutions resolve. And <laughs> that is a <laughs> It is a partner conference, so partners and I never looked at it. I'm sorry. I never looked at it. I never thought of it that way. That was the first I thought of it that way. So I learned it's something, you, Amanda. Jack. Thank you. I know. <laughs> right. right and so <laughs> here, okay, we're headquartered in Louisville. So this is a conference in Louisville where we pull together our partners. Our partners do presentation presentations, our product managers, our advisors that um, work hand-to-hand -hand as consultants with our partners do presentations. So it's a really big information users conference that we have each January. So hope that answers your question fully. If you have any questions, of course, you can um, ask, uh, email me, uh, Amanda Scott or Jack Clutt, and we can talk to you about that more. So I just want to go ahead and, and tie it up for the day as we're getting a little bit closer to the top of the hour. And thank everyone for attending. I also want to thank Jack Klett for um, presenting with this Capture web presentation today. A recording of this presentation will be sent out to you guys as well as slides. Um, in case you have the slide deck and want to share it with your colleagues. And don't be shy. Let us know anything else that you have questions on. And we're just very happy to get to spend our afternoon with you. Thank you.